Hey there guys, my name is Robert Hansford. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate a few interesting ways you can use Affinity Designer's powerful vector tools in iPadOS to create comic and cartoon illustrations. Enjoy! All right, guys, if you'd like to follow along with me, there should be a link to the session files in the description. When you're ready, tap the plus symbol on Affinity Designer's home screen, then tap New from Template. Locate and select the session file, and you should see this one-eyed ogre fellow snarling back at you. This illustration is primarily vector-based and took a couple of hours to complete. Over the course of this session, I'll demonstrate every tool and technique I use to create it, along with a few other ideas on how you might use your vector tools to create this kind of artwork. Basically, everything that you need to know can be learned by reconstructing the head. So to cut down on the length of the session, that's where we'll focus most of our attention. We'll start with the basics of using our vector tools and then work our way from vector inking to coloring. If you're curious about something I've done in my final artwork, just pop open the layer stack and take a look. I've left it all there for you. Most of the work we'll be doing involves the use of the pencil, vector brush, pen, and shape tools in concert with the Move tool, Node tool, Color Studio, and Stroke Studio. You'll also want to get acquainted with the three amigos down here, Deselect, Snapping, and Delete. The pencil tool allows for the freehand drawing of vector curves. You can set the stroke, controller, and fill in the context menu. The sculpt option helps us draw complex curves line by line, allowing us to pick up our pencil between each stroke. It's pretty handy. With the vector brush tool, you can add shape and texture to the strokes of your curves by utilizing a custom vector brush. We'll explore this a bit further in just a few minutes. Both the pencil and brush tool feature a stabilizer option which aids in simplifying the curve data as we draw. The rope stabilizer is for long and flowing curves, whereas the window stabilizer is for complex or oscillating curves. Next, we come to the pen tool. With this bad boy, we can draw curves node by node with great precision. We can even edit our curve as we draw by tapping edit mode in the context menu. This effectively gives us access to functions normally reserved for the node tool. The pen tool also has a few different drawing modes that can help with drawing different types of curves. I really enjoy using the pen tool in smart mode. A variety of press and hold gestures can be used while working with any of these tools. Notably, with all three tools, a two finger press and hold will allow you to make simple edits to the nodes of your curve if needed. The shape tool comes in handy in all kinds of situations. One thing to remember is that shapes are not curves and they must first be converted to curves in order to be edited as such. There are two ways to do this. The most convenient is the button that appears in the context toolbar. The other way is to select your shape and then select convert to curves from the edit menu. Once you've laid down your curves, you can use the Move and Node tools to reposition, resize, or edit them. We'll talk a little bit more about these during the inking phase. We can change the color of our fills and strokes in the Color Studio. And we can edit the pressure curve, size, and several other characteristics of our strokes in the Stroke Studio. I should also mention the fact that many of Affinity Designer's keyboard shortcuts are available to you on the iPad version. Check out this sweet graphic I snagged from the Affinity website. Taking a look, we can see that most of the iOS version's tool selection shortcuts are carried over from the desktop version. But did you know that you can even program custom shortcuts for your studio windows? I find myself using these quite a bit. That pretty much covers the basics. Now, let's talk a little more about the Vector Brush tool before we start the inking process.
Let's take a look at the Brush Studio. There are three types of vector brushes we can use. We have solid, textured intensity, and textured image brushes. For this project, I used a custom textured intensity brush. I really enjoy seeing texture and grit in my line work. Before diving into brush creation, I thought I'd demonstrate that textured intensity brushes have one minor drawback when compared with solid brushes. Strokes made with solid brushes can be expanded, while those made with intensity brushes cannot be expanded. It's a small trade-off. Since I don't find myself using the Expand Stroke option very often, it isn't a deal-breaker for me. But it is an important distinction to make, and I thought I'd mention it before moving on. Making a custom vector brush is pretty easy and a lot of fun once you get the hang of it. Let's make one together. To start, let's zoom out just a bit, grab the shape tool and draw a rectangle with a black fill. While using the shape tool, you can set the fill in the color studio before you begin to draw. We want this rectangle to stretch along the width of the canvas. Let's alter its dimensions in the Transform Studio. 4,500 pixels by 450 pixels should be just fine. Now, make sure snapping is turned on. Grab the Move tool and snap the rectangle to the center of the artboard. If you're not seeing the green and red lines, make sure Snap to Spread is turned on. You can find this option under Snapping in the Document menu. Now, in the Layer Studio, select the Rectangle Layers option menu and lock it into place. Back in the Document menu, let's lay down some guides. I'll add both a horizontal and vertical guide and lock them into place. Now, let's switch over to the Pixel Persona and take a look at the Brush Studio. For my custom inker, I used the dense grain chalk brush from the dry media menu. I really like the thick, chunky marks this brush makes. In order for our brush image to work correctly, we must export a white textured image on a black background. Our paintbrush tool is already selected, so let's grab some pure white from the color studio and get ready to make our marks. Here's a cool trick that you might not know. We can draw perfectly straight horizontal or vertical lines by holding down the shift key on our keyboards while we draw. Pretty sweet, right? Now, in the brush tool context menu, let's increase the width of our stroke to about 300 pixels. Then, with the rectangle selected, draw out a horizontal stroke holding down the shift key. The guides are there to help you visually. The assistant should create a new layer as soon as you begin to draw inside the rectangle and Painting back and forth a few times should ensure the stroke is dense enough. Once you're happy with your stroke, select the Move tool and snap it to center. Now, let's select the rectangle layer and export our brush image. On the export screen, make sure JPEG is selected and under Area choose Selection Only. Then export your image. I'll name mine Custom Inker. Now, let's head back over to Designer Persona and open up the Brush Studio. We need to create a new category for our brush. From the drop down menu, select Add Category. 
From the same drop-down menu, you can rename your new category whatever you like. Next, from the drop-down menu, select New Textured Intensity Brush. Locate your image and select it and you should see a new brush settings window. For now, I'll make sure the body is set to stretch and I'll increase the width just a bit. We're going to create two different versions of this brush. Tap and hold on the newly created brush and then select Duplicate. Now tap and hold on the brush copy and select Edit. From here, we can set our pressure variance to 100% and adjust the pressure curve to our liking. Personally, I don't like pressing too hard on the screen with my pencil, so I like to lower my curve's output just a bit and add a tiny degree of offset to the start of the curve. You might need to experiment a bit to find the settings that work best for you. To wrap up, tap and hold one more time to rename your brush. I'll name mine Inker and Liner, respectively. We'll be using the Inker to draw flowing and sharply tapered cursive lines and the Liner when we need a close shape or consistent stroke width. If your brush image was drawn perfectly straight and maintains a consistent height at both ends, it should be able to seamlessly frame a shape drawn with the Shape tool. Play around with the settings a bit and get comfy with your new brushes. Once you're satisfied, we can start the inking process. For this part, to make sure I hit all the important points, I'll be speeding up and slowing down the video when necessary. Firstly, let's get rid of these guides. We won't be needing them anymore. From the guides context bar, we can toggle the visibility, but we can also grab hold of the guides with our pencil. Once we do, the option to delete appears in the context menu. All right, let's take a look at our brushes one last time before we start slinging those strokes around. Remember, with the liner brush, we didn't assign any value to the pressure curve, but take notice of how the controller option in the context bar will override the selected brush's settings. This is good to know and can be useful at times. Also, I'll add some subtle pressure controls to our liner brush. If we want to use this brush with a closed curve, we won't be able to adjust the pressure curve of the stroke unless we adjust the settings a bit. We can increase the size variance to 100% and add a very shallow input curve. This will give us the ability to utilize pressure control without completely destroying the brush's purpose. I think I'll also adjust the size a bit, but we can always change it back later on. There, all set. Now it will still behave very much like a liner, but any pressure exerted will have a reduced effect and we can now use the Stroke Studio to edit the pressure curve as needed. As always, while working in Vector Persona, a good order of operations requires that we add a vector layer before beginning to draw. This will help keep the project neat and organized. I've started with the eye, and right away we have an opportunity to talk about press and hold gestures that can be used with the node tool. There are already a lot of videos on this topic out there, so I'll keep it brief. With only the pencil, you can add nodes by double tapping, select and delete them, move them around, and adjust their control handles at will. With the control handle selected, a one finger press and hold isolates it, creating a cusp. The selected handle can then be moved freely and its actions will not be mirrored. With the control handle selected, a two finger press and hold will snap movements of the control handle to increments of 15 degrees. You can also align and snap them to symmetry. With the control handle selected, a three finger press and hold will mirror control handle movements. While a node is selected and using a four finger press and hold, 
the selected node becomes a sharp point, locking the control handles into place. If a control handle is selected, a four-finger press behaves much like a one-finger press. Ah, chaotic pressure curve data. A micro-mirror, if you will, reflecting the imperfect perfection of the human condition. They can get pretty gnarly, but cleaning up these curves is a breeze. Just tap a node, and you can choose to delete it or reset the curve. I generally look for a basic peak pattern in my curve and try to simplify it. For this particular curve, I've noticed a peak and valley pattern. A small peak, a valley, and a larger peak. I just try to get rid of the nodes that appear redundant. Using this strategy, I usually end up with a smooth curve that I can be happy with. If we open up the advanced area of the Stroke Studio, we can adjust the caps, joints, alignments, and miters of our curves. Selecting the Butt Cap option is often a great way to eliminate small, unwanted overlaps. Here's a neat little job for the Pencil and Node Tool Duo. A one-finger swipe across a layer will select it, and subsequently swiped layers will be added to a bulk selection. From there, you can tap the Group button at the top of the Layer Studio. Well, I took a few liberties and added some extra skin wrinkles around Mr. Ogre's eyeball here. Man, that's quite a few strokes and quite a bit of swiping, but not to worry. With the first layer selected, I can perform a two-finger tap on the last layer I intend to group. This will bulk select all the layers in between. It's surprising how much time this little gesture saves once it becomes habit. It might seem obvious, but I thought that I'd mention grouping logic. I tend to group things by either proximity or component. For example, here, I'm grouping my strokes by Mr. Ogre's facial features. You gotta stay organized. Just make sure there's a rhyme and reason to it. Yep, closed shape, consistent line width. Looks like a pen tool jab. I'll switch over to my liner brush and adjust the pressure curve to get it just right. Notice how the top of my horn has a flat joint. In the advanced area of the Stroke Studio, I can select the miter joint type and increase the miter limit in order to get the sharp point I'm looking for. Maybe I'm just hungry, but Mr. Ogre's head looks like a baked potato to me. The pen tool in smart mode is perfect for baked potatoes. While using the pen tool, the pressure data from the previous curve will often be passed on to the next curve. To resolve this, even before we draw, we can simply open up the Stroke Studio, tap on a pressure curve node, and select Reset Pressure. All right, our first obstacle. How would you handle this? There are a couple of ways we can do it. We could edit the curve and remove the segment that is causing the unwanted overlap, but if we take a close look at the curve in its entirety, there are several places where it will eventually be causing overlaps. This could get us bogged down in minutia. There is another way though, one that I think is often overlooked. We can use a mask. Selecting the curve in the layer menu and selecting mask layer from the add menu will assign a mask layer to the curve. Now, in Pixel Persona, with a basic brush and pure black, we can simply conceal the parts we don't need. 
This is awesome because it is non-destructive and in some cases saves a little bit of time. Also, masks do not affect layers outside of their immediate grouping. So the mask we've just painted on won't appear or affect us at all when we're ready to color. And they scale with the artwork. So if and when you decide you need to resize something, the mask will scale with your curve. For my last little vector inking gem, I guess I'll just say, don't hesitate to duplicate. All living creatures and most things in nature possess features that present with both symmetry and repetition. We can duplicate things like teeth or scales using the move tool and a two finger press and hold gesture. Then we can quickly flip or rotate them using the Transform Studio. Why draw something six times when you can draw it just once? All right, that pretty much wraps up the inking demo. Before moving on, I'll clean up, consolidate, and label the groups in my layer stack, and then take a snapshot to preserve my progress. Once you're happy with your inks, it's time to start thinking about color. The color profile for this document is CMYK. I really enjoy working and thinking in the CMYK color space. For the record, I'm not a professional comic book colorist and I'm not implying that CMYK is somehow better than RGB. This is simply a personal preference and it's something I've been playing with a lot over the last year. Let's just chalk it up to nostalgia. Check this out. This is my favorite color palette. It's the YRB64 color palette, made famous by its publication in the book, How to Color Comics the Marvel Way. I use these colors to color Mr. Ogre here. I love this palette. It evokes memories and has meaning for me. What makes these colors special is that none of them have K or black in them at all. Each swatch is made up of only cyan, magenta, and yellow in values of 0, 25, 50, and 100%. These color formulas are from a different time and came about through decades of trial and error or process refinement. With all that most illustrators know and have access to these days, it probably seems silly to imagine coloring an entire illustration or comic using only these colors. When I use them, I try to think of them as starting points only. We can adjust the percentages in order to create any colors we might need using the CMYK sliders in the Color Studio. We can even add black to them, but when we do, we must do so with care. Keeping our black levels reasonably low ensures that our image will print beautifully and maintain excellent readability. If you're interested in learning more about four color process and printing, there are lots of great YouTube channels and websites out there regularly stoking the embers of the CMYK versus RGB debate. Now, if you'd rather work in RGB, I won't hold it against you. You can easily change the color profile in the document menu and building your own palette is just as easy. For starters, open the Color Studio and select Add Document Palette from the drop-down menu. Okay, sweet. Now we need some colors. Let's pull some colors from a reference image using Safari. Safari works great for this purpose because it allows us to drag and drop an image onto our spread. You know, as I sat down to film this session, it struck me that Mr. Ogre here looks like he'd be right at home hanging out with Beastman or Skeletor on Snake Mountain. Let's see what we can dig up.
perfect. This one's got them all, and the colors are really vivid. Now that the image is on my spread, I'm going to resize and deselect it immediately so that I don't alter its color by accident. From here, we can zoom in, grab the Color Picker tool, and begin selecting colors from the image. Once a color has been selected, tap on the swatch in the top right of the panel to designate the selected color as the Current Fill. Then, from the drop-down menu, select Add Current Fill to Palette. And that's all there is to it. So, repeat this process until you're satisfied. You can rename your palette by selecting Rename Palette from the drop-down menu. Man, take a good look at these Motley Crews here. Every single one of these characters was designed using a very basic four or five color palette. Working in a cartoon style, five colors is really all we need. It might be a good idea to hold on to your reference image. You know, just in case you want to sample some more of this super saturated Saturday morning celluloid swag. Let's rename the layer, tidy up, toggle its visibility, and tuck it away for safekeeping. Oh, what's this? Looks like I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Before we jump into the process demo, I thought I'd briefly demonstrate some of the coloring techniques that are available to us while working with vector tools. For experienced illustrators, some of these techniques will be old hat. However, I think a lot of them will appear quite fresh to the growing number of beginners and young artists out there that are picking up Affinity Designer for the first time. I suppose I should start by paying respects to all the pixel pushers and raster masters out there. What can I say? Most people have been doing it this way for a long time, and it works. It's familiar, fast, convenient, enjoyable, and can be pretty therapeutic at times. For me, though, the one major drawback is that we can't edit our shapes or colors easily. If we want to edit our colors, we need to utilize selection tools that can sometimes be finicky or aggravating depending on the complexity of the selection. This is true in almost all drawing and painting applications. I suppose you can also use adjustment layers. I don't know about you, but stopping to add these kind of pulls me out of my creative flow. These next few bits are for all you node ninjas out there. Coloring in Vector Persona can be done just as fast and conveniently as in Pixel Persona, and we can easily edit our colors. In addition, we have access to the powerful gradient and transparency tools. You know, Affinity Designer really is the best of both worlds. Utilizing vector curves makes our flats editable and we can still add texture and organic qualities using masks and textured brushes in Pixel Persona. In this example, I've duplicated my flat layer and selected a lighter color. Then I added an empty mask layer and revealed it using a duster brush, giving the impression of texture. But then I wondered, what would this look like in blue? Here, I've duplicated my flat layer again, and I set the new layer's color to a grayish purple that contains just a bit of black. Then I set the layer mode to multiply. Utilizing a mask in Pixel Persona, I can use a brush to paint out the areas of shadow I'm looking for. I repeat this process again using the screen layer mode and an orange color to create highlights. The great thing about this is that I can change the color of the layers producing the shadows and highlights quite easily from within the color studio. Okay, okay, I get it. You're just a He-Man raster hater and you never want to touch another raster brush again. No problem, dude. You can just draw out your curves with the pencil tool as needed. They'll still be super editable and you can still use them with your layer modes. If they become too numerous, you can simply add them together using the Add or Merge Curves command in the Edit menu. And let's not forget about those gradients. 
But Rob, I'm into manga. What about my manga? I want my screen tones. I got your screen tones right here, pal. It's called a bitmap gradient. With the Gradient Tools bitmap option, we can effectively transform our vector curves into sheets of manga screen tones. After choosing the image to apply, we can use the Gradient Fills controllers to adjust the scale and rotation of the image being used. After applying the gradient, we set the layer mode to darken and again apply a mask and reveal as desired. There are literally terabytes of free high quality screen tones to be found all over the internet. To bring things to a close, I filmed a short coloring demo and I'll talk a little bit about each step in my coloring process. Like I said in the beginning, everything you need to know about coloring an entire illustration this way can be learned by coloring the head. I won't really be covering anything new concerning the drawing tools. If you made it through the inking phase and completed your inks, you're probably ready to tackle your colors. To get started, I usually block in all the flats with the base that I want to use. Then, I consolidate the vector shapes as much as possible. Take the head for example. It's made up of four different curves. I simply add them together in the edit menu. It's really useful and I can still edit each part separately if need be. For the next few parts, I switch over to the pencil tool for a bit. I like being able to use the sliders to mix colors right in the context menu before laying down my curves. Working with vector tools will certainly make you resourceful. We've got plenty of nodes here, and some of them just aren't pulling their weight. Rather than drawing out a completely new curve and adding it using the edit menu, we can just put some of these nodes to work with the node tool. Again with the teeth, I draw my curve with the pen tool. They are basically smooth triangles, so I really only need three nodes. Drawing with the pen tool keeps things simple and clean, giving me control over exactly how many nodes each curve has. This concept can be applied to any part of this illustration. Reducing the number of nodes usually makes editing super easy, and of course, I duplicate where I can to save time. After I finish laying down my flats, I bulk select the layers and duplicate them. Then I consolidate them into groups and give them appropriate labels. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these days I like to work in CMYK. Again, this is just a personal preference. During this phase, I go through each group and mix the colors I want to use for the areas of my illustration that are receiving increased light. Conversely, with the inside of the mouth, I create a darker layer that I intend to use in tandem with a mask to create the impression of depth. Once I'm finished there, I go back and add empty mask layers to each of my new vector curves. Then I use white and pixel persona to reveal the lighter colors. I love doing things this way because you can get a good idea about the final result without worrying too much about it in the moment. It's freeing to know that you can always come back and play with the colors a bit without any real hassles. Here, I simply forgot to draw his uvula. And yes, I had to look that up. But you know what? It was worth it. For the eye here, I use a radial gradient and boost the magenta to really make his eyeball pop.
Now I'm going to go back and make one final pass for highlights and shadows. Here, I'm aiming to create shadow. First, I duplicate my lights layer and add a little black to the color mixture. Then, I set its layer mode to multiply, add a mask, and get some shading painted in there. Then, I do the same thing for the eye, but this time I use a little Gaussian blur via an effects layer to blend the shadow. Here's a little something I didn't do in my original illustration. I grab one of my custom splatter brushes and add some splotchiness to his skin first. I play around with the layer modes a bit, but then decide on changing the colors. I do so by adding a colored overlay via an effects layer. Then, I tuck it into the base layer of the head group. Finally, because I have very little self-control, on a new pixel layer placed at the top of the layer stack, I go nuts adding shine and speculars using an inking brush and pure white. Alright guys, that's going to bring this session to a close. I hope you found it interesting and enjoyable. Thank you to Affinity for having me and thanks to all of you for watching. Take care of yourselves, keep working hard, and we'll see you out there. Cheers.